Yippee, the Affordable Care Act will just solve the biggest problems. If only it were true. But the truth is that government solutions are the problem. Government does too much and promises too much. Dan Mitchell and Abby McCloskey spend their working days looking at the budget and how it's grown, and they work for competing think tanks. Uh, Dan's with the Cato Institute, Abby's with the American Enterprise Institute. Dan, you say that the $17 trillion debt is just, it's not the problem, it's just a symptom. It's a symptom of the problem of government being too big and doing too much. And let's do an analogy. Let's say that you went to the doctor because you were coughing a lot and you found out that you had lung cancer. Oh, that's really bad. But what if the doctor said, well, here's some Robitussin, you won't cough anymore. Will you be happy with that? No, of course not. You want to deal with the underlying if problem. If it worked, I would. Uh... Well, it might get rid of your cough, but it's not going to deal with oh. the lung cancer. And the problem is government has exploded in size, as that chart you uh, had illustrated. And because of entitlements that are poorly designed in demographic change, the burden of government spending is going to reach European levels in the future. Something has to be done because no amount of tax increases is going to solve the problem. As a matter of fact, that would probably make the problem worse because politicians Europe, would just spend the money. What's wrong with European levels? People say Europe's doing okay. Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and it's just a matter of time before France hits their fiscal crisis, Belgium hits their fiscal crisis, all of the Western world, Japan, of course, is going to blow up, not in Europe, but same problems of politicians promising things they can't deliver and imposing tax burdens that are crippling private sectors. And yet, Abby, all week I heard, and we're going to hear it from Bob Beckel later, it's the problem is this debt ceiling. They shouldn't have one. It's, it's the uncertainty. Right. I mean, the debt limit has been turned into the enemy in this debate as opposed to the actual federal debt. And in 25 years, everything we make and buy and consume in this economy, that will all be the same size as a federal debt. And we know from economic research that when a country has that much debt, we have really slow growth, less jobs, people can re can't retire. It's a real problem. Today, the president said, stop treating government like an enemy. People will stop treating government like the enemy when the government stops stealing from us. And I'll stop regarding it as an enemy when it stops spending three plus trillion dollars. It, it's hilarious to go back in time and look how responsible Senator, Senator Obama was when he ran for president. He was upset about how the previous president increased our debt. The way Bush has done it over the last eight years is to take out a credit card from the Bank of China so that we now have over $9 trillion of debt that, that we are going to have to pay back. That's irresponsible. It's unpatriotic. Then just five years later, Mr. Obama is president, and suddenly the debt isn't the problem, the debt ceiling is the problem. Congress must authorize the Treasury to pay America's bills. This is done with a simple, usually routine vote to raise what's called the debt ceiling. This is important. Raising the debt ceiling is not the same as approving more spending. It's not? I already gave one unfriendly analogy involving lung cancer. Let's do another one. Let's say I'm a drug addict. I'm strung out on heroin. I will feel better in the short run if I inject more heroin. In the long run, though, I'll be better off whether I'm going cold turkey or a methadone clinic or figuring out some way to get from my addiction to being cured. And likewise, we have to figure out how we go from this addiction to government spending, whether it's financed by borrowing or taxes. That is the problem we have to deal with it. We have too many people in our country who are being trapped by, in effect, the heroin of government dependency. We have all these special interest groups, lobbyists. Washington is one of the most corrupt towns you could imagine. We need to where, fix that. Where you guys live and where I don't see people objecting to it. Most people, we do. Well, we heard a lot of people objecting to the fact that the government was shut down and that we were about to default on our debt. But it was shocking we didn't hear more people talking about the $17 trillion of debt we see. And the debt limit is one of the few times during the congressional calendar that politicians have to come together and fess up to all the free lunches they've been giving out and say, actually, this costs a lot of money, and guess who gets to pay for it? But then we're Us. doomed if nobody cares. Well, people care. We saw the Tea Party care and, you know, throw a... Rent in this sliver debate. of the electorate. It's a sliver of the electorate, but they have managed to capture the public debate and refocusing our attention to the debt. Now, their efforts in this last time were far from successful. I think a lot of people are disappointed about the deal we reached, but at least we're talking about the debt. 
and spending. 3.6 trillion is the problem. And I find it fascinating how many politicians will say government doesn't even have a spending problem. Here's Senator Harkin from Iowa. If we're so rich, why are we so broke? Is it a spending problem? No. So it, it is a, almost a false argument to say we have a spending problem. We have a budget deficit problem that we have to address. We don't have a spending problem. Last year, President Obama spent 45 percent more than the tax revenues we got in. That's not some minor budgetary issue. That is an entire mismanagement of federal resources. We have a spending problem. It would be great if we could figure out a way to cap spending. Maybe that's something this joint committee um, as part of the debt limit deal can work on. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> and I get angry listening to some of these congressmen speak. It, it sounds as if they think the world revolves around them and government. Listen to Senator Durbin here talking to the press before this week's agreement. He's so arrogant. People of America have seen uh, this movie several times. The American damsel is tied to the tracks and the engine is bearing down and the question is whether or not Congress at the last minute will come to the rescue and save this country. Government's gonna save the country. I like Senator Durbin's analogy but what he didn't tell us is that He's driving the train, and all the cars attached to the train are Medicaid, Medicare, food stamps, the military budget, the Department of Transportation. That's what our problem is right now. We have gone so far afield from what our founding fathers wanted in terms of a limited central government bound by the chains of the Constitution, and yet if you're one of the pushers up on Capitol Hill, which is what Senator Durbin and Senator Harkin and the rest are, they think it's great because they get to buy votes with our money. I'll build on Dan's analogy a little bit. I mean, where is President Obama with this train bearing towards a damsel on the tracks? Instead of rising above the partisan bickering, the congressional gridlock, and acting like the leader of the free world we'd hope our president to be, he's urging the train to go fast. Well, he likes to spend. He always he, who has. doesn't when you don't have to be accountable to who's paying for it? All week I heard that not raising the debt ceiling would be a disaster from America, for America, and that everyone knows that. Philosophically opposed you might be to borrowing money, however distasteful it is to you ideologically. Everybody realizes that as long as we are borrowing money, not raising the debt ceiling, defaulting on our debt would be a very irresponsible thing to do. It would be a disaster for the country. Everybody realizes that. Everybody realizes that. Defaulting on our debt would be a disaster for the country, but that's not what would happen if we didn't increase the debt ceiling. The federal government this fiscal year is projected to collect 12 times as much revenue as is needed to pay interest on the debt. The now, debt is $300 billion. They collect 300 the, the, the debt, they collect the, the interest trillion. on the debt this year is going to be about $235 billion. Tax revenues are going to be about $3 trillion. Now, I don't have great faith in the competence of the federal government, but even I think that with $3 trillion, they could somehow figure out how to prioritize their spending so that they paid the $235 billion of interest on the debt so we didn't default. Would it be messy? Would it be a hassle? Yes, of course it would be. But this whole notion that we would default without an increase in the debt ceiling was either dishonest or ignorant. And fi finally, I... I want to point out that people on the street didn't know what to cut when I said they said, yes, we should cut. People had no idea what to cut. Six. So what would you cut? What would I cut? What would I cut? That's a tough question. So what would you cut? I would have to put some thought into it and see the choices, I guess. I don't know to tell you the truth. I mean, I don't. They just don't know. We need reforms to entitlements for this country to be sustainable. And I would also recommend having some sort of cap on federal spending so we can actually have a real conversation about what size should the federal government be. All we need to do is limit government so it grows at the rate of inflation and we balance the budget in five years. I would like genuine cuts, but simply slowing down the growth of government will get us where we need to be over time. Good luck with that. Thank you, Dan, Abby.